Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Avi. I work at Alphamai as the head of data science, and I want to talk to you about classifying documents using GNNs, graph neural networks. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about how graph neural networks work. Uh, it's a very heavy topic. Don't expect to, to come out an expert, but I do hope to give you some sense of how it works and why it's worthwhile and how to pursue this. Um, so a bit of myself, I'm father of two. Most of the time, uh, they get along, especially the, if there are snails around. And the like dancing, I used to have shorter hair. So why graphs? Um, we know a lot about how to deal uh, with data points individually, but in real life, uh, our data points, they want to say something about or predict something, have connections between them, they have relations that we need to address. And if we use this, this data, we can perform better uh, predictions on our data and understand it better and analyze it better. So just a few examples of how real work data, uh, real world data is represented naturally as graph. Uh, so we all know the social networks. It's a very heavy topic, heavily researched, heavily used by most of us. And naturally there are other networks that we know from life, from our life, computer networks, train networks, all of them are networks. You have uh, stations connected. Uh, knowledge graphs are a certain type of uh, graph where we use to represent our knowledge of the world in a structured way. Uh, and even code and molecules can represent it as graphs of various sizes. So the outline of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about graph machine learning tasks and examples of how uh, these tasks were solved efficiently and uh, gave great expressive power using uh, graphs in the recent uh, decade. Um, I'll talk a little bit about message passing on graphs, which is a classical work, but it serves as a basis for graph neural networks, which are generally an extension of message passing. And if time allows, I'll talk about how we did a small PLC on our data and we hope to expand it later uh, as optimized. So typically we can um, group tests of uh, um, graph machine learning into several types. The first being the node level. We want to say something about the node level, whether a node is an outlier or maybe it's uh, uh, of a certain um, category. So it's just a classification task uh, or an anomaly detection class on, uh, on a specific node. The second type is the edge level, where typically we want to say whether an edge uh, between two nodes should exist or not. And we'll see an example of that later. Um, another type of test is for graph level prediction. So if we talked about, we, we've seen that there, that molecules can be presented as graphs. So it, sometimes you want to, they, to say something about the graph as a whole, not just parts of it. So for example, I want to say something about a molecule. Um, and some tests relate to subgraphs. So some of it is, we need to say something about a particular set, subset of nodes or edges in the graph or we want to find, automatically find subsets of the graph that uh, connect heavily together, which is called community uh, detection. So let's look at some examples just to please the eye. Uh, the first and foremost being uh, how to categorize papers. This work done back in 2016. And here we are given, is, the problem is given a citation network, a uh, list of papers citing each other. And we have a bag of words for each paper representing um, just, you know, the words, the common words in uh, that paper. Uh, some of the papers are tagged with their specific category. And our uh, mission is to find the paper categories for all uh, the papers in the data set. So if we want to present that as a graph, we would, we would say we would um, represent papers as nodes and the edges would be the sightings. So there will be an edge between uh, node U and node V, if paper you cited, uh, paper V. And this also is using uh, graphs. This is a very nice uh, visualization of it. Uh, the different colors are, of course, different uh, categorizations. Um, another example is a recommender system, uh, and we map it to a link prediction test on a graph. So uh, I guess all of you know what, what recommender systems do uh, in that sense. Um, they they um, we're giving user interactions with certain items. It can be movies, it can be merchandise uh, or music they listen to. 
And if we want, if we want to, and we are giving their interactions of what they have done, what they have watched, what they have bought, what they have been interested in, and we want to suggest new things um, to um, improve their experience with our system. In that case, if we want to model it as a graph, uh, our nodes would be users and items. So you have two two types of nodes. This is called a bipartite graph because we have two types of uh, nodes, and they only interact between the groups and not inside. Uh, and the edges would be, there would be an edge between user and item if they have interacted with it. And our goal is to recommend more stuff that the user would want. Um, so here's an example of how it was uh, solved using graphs and they compared it to other methods. So example, I want to um, suggest a, a pin on Pinterest similar to that one. So naturally uh, I want to, if I have a cake, I want to, I want to see more cakes, it makes sense but it has no relation to um, a shirt, even though it has the same color. So they've compared similar uh, various ways of uh, constructing similarity between items. The first relied only on visual. So as you can see, uh, we see the sprouts and they were giving different um, recommendations that also have circles inside, because this is what the network has detected. If we look at the annotations, this is annotated as a plant, and we see more plants. Uh, this method uses only the interactions, but their method uses the interaction together with the visual representation in order to construct more um, powerful recommendations and similarities. And this is where the expressive power of, of graph neural nets, which we're going to, to discover uh, next, uh, it comes into play because you can uh, at one at one go take take advantage of the attributes of specific nodes as well as their relationship to other nodes. This is where the power comes from. Another example from my own life: um, we deal with access requests. So, so, for example, if we have Bella is a, uh, uh, a team lead and she has people reporting to her, we want to and 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 some people have access to some sensitive data. We want to ask to be able to answer the question of whether Anna should have access to the data or not. So this is sort of also a link prediction task that we can use here. We have in this really simple solution, example, we might have a very good solution that you know most of the team has access and it should have it too, uh, but sometimes it gets more complex. Last example of graph classification. We talked about, uh, we didn't talk about it, but the, um, uh, drug discovery, um, we want to be able to, you know, search for new drugs and we want to be able to tell from the get-go, even before we, we create uh, uh, the, the chemical or the molecules, we want to be able to predict whether it has some way of answering or treating the um, disease or some symptom that we want to, to treat without generating uh, uh, major uh, side effects. And this is something that can be done and is done using graph classification, where we take the whole graph as the input and we want to output whether, uh, for example, here, whether a molecule can be conserved as an antibiotic treatment, but we also want it to be, for example, soluble in water or maybe don't cause other side effects such as, you know, this. Uh, and the nodes here would be the atoms and the edges would be the chemical bond. This is a very natural way of, the, of representing the molecule. Um, so now we're taking a sharp turn and I want to talk about message passing and graphs. It's very simple, but it, again, it acts as a basis for how graph neural nets work. So the very basic example is label propagation. Suppose I have labels on some of, of the nodes in my uh, graph and I want to be able to tell, to see something about the whole graph. It's like a semi-supervised learning. What we do, uh, we iterate on the graph, and in each iteration, each node would pass its own state. In this case, it's the label. It would patch it, it pass its own state as a message to each other neighbor, saying, hey, you should be part of the blue group. You should be part of the red group. And each, um, and, and each node in its turn, including the nodes that have emitted their own messages, they also receive messages and they use some kind of logic in order to update their own state for the next iteration. 
And so in the simplest form, it would be a, a majority vote. They would just say, oh, okay, well, most of the people around me are, are blue, I'll also be blue. And uh, the algorithm stops when it converges or when it exceeds the limit because sometimes it can reach a convergence uh, in some uh, fatal cases. Um, it's also used for community detection where each node would initially have its own label saying, oh, I, I want to form a community. And then as we propagate through this and iterate, uh, some communities will be annihilated when we're left with uh, a few um, um, communities. So the next step we want to do, as I said, this is a very simple form, a simple form, but it can also it can be generalized, and we want to see how we can generalize it. So, for example, so one one form of generalization is starting to think of it as each node information holds its hidden state, and here we're you know we're diverging into uh, stuff that we know from deep learning. Um, each node has its hidden state. Um, and the message it passes doesn't have to be its own state. It can be some sort of a function on its state and also a function on the uh, incoming state. And also, instead of majority voice, we can do different uh, aggregations and activation functions on what have you. And we can select whatever function we want. And we can combine when we, when we want to update uh, the state of a node, we combine its own state with its neighbor state. So for those of you who like um, equations, sometimes it's easier to see in an equation. Uh, here, hij is the message that is passed from node uh, i to j. And it depends on the state of i, the state of j, and some uh, properties of the edge, perhaps its own hidden state, which can also be updated in a very more, more general way. And uh, f edge is sort of a, a function that takes all this input and creates a message that passes, for example, if we talk about h31 from node 3 to node 1. And then h1 um, tag is uh, the new state of edge i, sorry, uh, where we take the messages from all the neighbors, we take the existing state of the node, and we take the features of the node, xxi, and we use that to update the node using some function that can also be, uh, which is also general and we need to, to, to account for when it's selected. No, so, and here comes the, the question of how we select the functions. And this is where deep learning comes into place because um, in deep learning we have, uh, or differentiable learning, we have three pillars. Um, um, one is the data, of course. The other is we want to define some target function that we want to uh, achieve uh, to make our task work. And the second one, and the third one is the architecture. And the framework says that if you have the data and you have the target, you have a tar an architecture that you can use to update its weights to back, back propagate on, starting with, the, with your loss, you will, you will be able to uh, train this architecture and find uh, a way for it to uh, answer your question better. So the data uh, on our case is a graph. The target can be whatever uh, targets and losses that we know from other types of learning. It depends if we want to do node classification, that would be, for example, um, um, the regular loss that we know for classification for each node. And, and let's talk about the architecture a little bit. So don't be alarmed. Uh, we will go through this. Basically, um, what we do uh, in graph neural networks is each layer of the architecture corresponds to one inter iteration on the graph. So if the layer is, uh, if the network is three layers deep, we would have messages three layers long, uh, three hops long. For example, this is, a, this is an example of, of a two-layer uh, uh, network. And this is, uh, this is our graph. We can see that if we want to know what the hidden state of A would be after two iteration, we first look at the messages, the aggregation of messages it received from its neighbors. So that would be B, C, and D. And this is what we see here. These are the hidden states of them in the last iteration. These are the transformations. 
and um, and for them in turn, we also want to uh, know their own state. And the way this is calculated is by using um, the aggregation and uh, message passing from their own neighbors. For example, B, its neighbors are A and C, and we can see this here. A and C are being transformed into messages. Uh, they're aggregated in some way, and then we, we update the state of B. So this is how the graph structure looks like from the point of view of the A node. And we have a, bat a batch of networks each uh, for each node. We have a different uh, a topology of the network. But what's important to see here is that the building blocks do um, uh, repeat themselves. Uh, the local architecture changes, but uh, for example, in the first layer, the transformation that each node, that each hidden state goes through when generating the message is the same. These are all the same. These are same functions or weights that have to be learned. And this is how this is all connected. Um, so as I said, a layer in the neural networks corresponds to a message passing iteration. So for example, if the layer is, if the network is two layers deep, then each node would be affected by um, uh, nodes that are two layers, uh, two uh, hops apart from it, including itself, if it is connected to it, to itself. And this is called the receptive field of, um, of the network. And it's very important to take this into consideration the same way that we, for those of you who know, for example, vision, uh, it, it is important to take into, into account the receptive field of, uh, of uh, vision network. And we have repeating blocks on each layer. And we can also stack, again, and again, we use the differentiable learning here. We can stack other types of networks for pre-processing. For example, to you, to, in order to generate the, the, the first hidden state in the first layer of uh, the A node, I can, if, if it was an image, I can have a CNN, a conversion neural network for vision that uh, transformed the image into a latent representation of the image. And then in this way, generate the, hidden, the initial hidden state and when I train the model, I can update these um, um, weights, the weights of the image as well in one go. Cool. Then I'll talk a little bit about the POC that we've done um, at Atomize. And then I'll have time for questions because I guess there will be a lot because um, it's heavy. Um, so what we want to do is document types of files um, according to their sensitivity because we want to protect them in different ways. We have financial data. We have... Um, uh, private information, and each of those should have different exposure to people in, in and inside and outside the organization. Uh, so we typically have uh, files that are very important to protect, like, like financial reports, which should only be visible to very specific people in the organization. And on the other hand, we have maybe pictures of people's pets, which are uh, welcome to be shared across the organization, even outside of it. So for example, we can have a rule where if there's a file that is accessed by an account and then the CEO, it's probably very important you want to uh, limit the accessibility of it uh, to other people in the organization. And we have many rules in our system to, to accommodate for that, but we want to have something more general that could capture um, the types of people and um, learn their um, effect on the files and also the files themselves and use the titles in order to uh, make better predictions and perhaps discover stuff that we haven't seen. So we did a POC using GNNs and we were able to, to, to fetch for a certain clients 6% more documents, which we can later uh, uh, use to better protect the clients. Uh, the challenges that we're facing, and this is important, is that we have multiple types of nodes and relationships and most of the uh, work in the literature you know, is, is, is focused on one type of, uh, uh, of nodes, but maybe some, type, some types of relationships. But again, this is some, something that can be accommodated for because you can use the types of nodes and relationships as features of the nodes and, um, and edges and, and use an embedding layer on them in order to, um, which can also be learned in the same process, again, using differentiable learning, and, and this, is, this is where the power comes from. Uh, the graph size is also a problem. There are ways to address that by using, uh, uh, by dividing into the subgraphs and uh, making them talk to each other. And deployment, um, ML is a very hot topic right now. 
uh, in the industry, across the industry, but um, there's very little talk about how you do it with graphs, um, which is a challenge. Okay, just to summarize stuff that we've gone through. So graphs can represent real world data in, intuitive, in an intuitive way, and it's really recommended to look at it that way. Uh, it's intuitive for us as humans, it's a bit easier for the computer to understand, but we have ways to help them. Um, using relationships between objects together with their attributes uh, can lead to powerful predictions. And uh, what I wanted to uh, convey is that graph neural, net, neural networks uh, are a, is a universal framework for message passing on graphs. It just, you know, it's just message passing generalized uh, in a way that helps you uh, capture the real uh, important aspects of your data without specifying it explicitly, just by looking at the data. Um, and where to start, there are great courses. Uh, uh, courses. Uh, the one from Stanford uh, is great, I took it. There's also a, a course by Michael Bronstein, uh, which is really good. I haven't taken it, but uh, I've heard good stuff about it. And if you want to start coding, just look at the tutorials of the relevant libraries out there. Uh, you can Google it, they're great. I used two of them and it was really easy to get started. Thanks a lot. Now it's time for questions. Um, thanks for attending. Yeah, thank you, Avi. Uh, we have a question for you. Uh, the question is by Stephen, and the question is regarding the results of the POC, 6% additional document discovered compared to what baseline? Yeah, so the baseline was the heuristics that I discovered. Or, uh, that I mentioned earlier. I'm still analyzing the rules, but, uh, uh, but um, you know, the rule that I showed with the CEO and accountant is not something that we've written. It's actually something that we've discovered using that tool, uh, which was really great for us. We, or that, uh, you know, it, it led us to believe that we want to continue this POC. Um, and I hope to do it next month. Uh, thanks for the question. More questions from the chat, maybe? Uh, what are the rele re uh, relevant libraries for deal with graphs? Deep learning um, for with graphs. So there are four relatively um, popular libraries for it. And some of them are cross platform, and some of them are um, specific to you know, TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, I really like DGL, Deep Grub Library, uh, but there's also Python Geometric, PyG. The thing I like most about DGL is uh, that it's um, um, generic. It, it, it needs different back, uh, backbones. Um, it's, uh, MX, even MXNet and also TensorFlow and Python. Uh, but you can Google them. Uh, you can see all four of them. I don't remember the names of the others, but the other one, the one called Spectral. Uh, how do you deal with new categories coming into the graph? So um, it's not part of the talk, and it's really not something that it's, uh, Tom Nyhoff is, uh, is, is asking, how do you deal with new categories coming into the graph? And um, the answer is that it's not, um, I would deal with it in the same way that I'd use, the way that I do with any learning task that I'm handed. That's, that's, that's the whole um, power of putting this inside the differentiable learning uh, framework. So long as I have my own, my, my target um, um, represented in, in a clear way that, that serves my business purpose, and then I can do whatever it, ta it takes to accommodate for changes in the data. So it's not different from regular learning tests. Whatever you see for it um, can apply to graph learning. And we can talk about it later if you want uh, on Slack. 